and I study fish behaviour um, in a series of clear water rivers around the town of Bonito. Hi, I'm George. Hi, I'm Ty. And welcome to my series, Meet the Scoper. Uh, Ty is the first guy I'm interviewing for the series, and I think it's a great way to start it off. We've got a beautiful aquarium here, and Ty's a really interesting guy. He's got so many cool stories, which we'll talk about later. But we'll start off by talking about the tank, if that's okay. Sure. So it's just a very kind of informal chat. We'll talk about the, the tank, the plants, the fish, uh, the setup, maintenance, and then we'll go into more yep. details as, as we go to take it nice and casual. Yep. Okay, so can you just tell us sort of about the tank itself, what size, and a little bit about the spec? Okay, it's a uh, 150 by uh, 60 by 45 uh, tank. Yeah, so 5 foot by 2 foot by 18 inches tall. Yep. Yep. And what volume? Uh, it's about 400 litres or so. Which is about 100 gallons. I had the glass made and um, the cabinet was made by a kitchen fitter next door to the shop where I got the glass. Oh, okay. You said, it. yep, I can build that for you. And lighting, looks like you've got the Kessel A360 WG yep. Sun. Two of these. I use these on my Acascaper 1200 with a spectral controller. Yep. And we're running at the lowest colour spectrum, so it's the warmest colour, so 6000 Kelvin at full intensity. Yeah. Yep. Um, I use a inline, the Hydor 300 watt heaters. Okay. Um, which I just love because it takes, it takes more equipment, equipment out of the tank. tank. Yeah. And I keep it at uh, about 24, 25 degrees, uh, depending on winter, summer. Okay. Um, as most of the species here can handle slightly cooler temperatures. Yeah. Um, and I prefer to keep it that way. So. I think this is a top tip for you guys. The cooler you can run the tank, obviously not compromising fish welfare, the better. Yeah. Everything metabolizes slower. You've got yeah. more room for error with algae. Every, you know, they don't need so much food, less yeah. waste is created. Less evaporation. <laughs> less evaporation. So a running cooler on the cooler end is my personal preference as yeah. well. I tend to run mine at about 23, 24, most of my tropical tanks. Yeah. Um, so lighting, tank, filtration, you've got two large external canisters, yep. a Heim and a, an Aqua One, which is a yep. cheap Chinese thing. Um, let's talk about the plants. I mean, yeah. I don't know about you guys, this is one of the lushest planted tanks I've seen in a long time and massively dominated by Cryptocorines. Yeah. So we've got uh, Eusteriana. There's Eusteriana, Ponegiglifolia, um, Balensai in there. Um, there's a large kind of stand of uh, Wentai Brown and Wentai Green. Uh, there's Cryptocorn Lucens, Petchai, some Legroy. Um, <laughs> A, a few lot, others that found their way in. Yeah. A lot of crypts. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys are crypt nerds, but um, yeah, you can have a field day in here. Uh, and this is quite dominating, this central area here. We call this Pelia, don't we? Uh, Monocelium Pelia, yeah. Monocelium. So it's like, a, it's not a moss, is it? It's like a liverwort? It is like a liverwort. And yeah. It normally would grow on very sort of moist rock and wood surfaces near waterfalls and rapids. Okay. So like, um, an, like an epiphyte or a rheophyte? Yeah. Yeah. Very like a real fight, yeah. and um, I started off with a, a small, you know, ball about this big, and yeah. in ten months it's gone to this. It's um, amazing. And the shrimp love it; they all sort of yeah. are in it, foraging away. And uh, Eleocharis, this taller one. Yeah. What's that called? This is Eleocharis montevidensis, okay. which is a um, species from around uh, Uruguay and southern Paraguay. And it's nice because it gets about a millimeter thick the stem, yeah. it can grow to about fifty centimeters. Right. And I've just put a few in, and it's sort of putting out runners. Nice. I just love the fine textures blending in with the broader textures. Yeah. It just has this natural kind of sense.
got some helanthium tanulum that looks quite new, yep. is it? Uh, yeah, I planted this in recently. Um, basically, I came back after 10 months away and I had some Sagittarius Superlata in here, mm-hmm. and it was just Sagittarius Superlata dominating. Yeah. You couldn't see yeah. in the tank, um, and I pulled it out, and I've, I've replaced it with some uh, Etanolus, which will hopefully yeah. be a bit more subdued. Yeah, um, I um, I've got Sagittarius in my flat Fluval Flex. Okay. It's, it's, well, it is CO2, but all those aerosol types. Okay, yeah. And even with that, it's just it's starting it's to take over the tank already, and it's it's only about eight weeks old. Yep. Um, so substrate, what's the substrate? Substrate is a real kind of mixture of, um, I think there's some old ADA um, Aquasoil? Uh, Aquasoil in there, um, there's even some John Inns number no. 3 uh, <laughs> compost. compost Which is a technique I heard was always good for crypts and has always sort of worked for me yeah. um, There's a few other sort of random uh, packs that have gone in there. It looks like, like, like the old aqua clay. Do you remember yeah. that? Is that what it is? Um, it may. I think it may be some of the ADA stuff that's broken down oh, into okay. the ADA Malaya. Yeah. Okay. Um, which is, is broken right there. But basically, it's a mixture of all sorts of stuff. It's obviously working. Yep. And how how long has this escape been running? Um, I set this up uh, about. January 2017. So pretty much a year. About a year old, but no uh, CO2 injection. No. Um, and I, it gets water changed about once a month. A friend, yeah. I've been living abroad, a friend of mine comes and, and water changes it. Um, occasionally it gets some liquid verts, yeah. um, one my family remember, um, but it's it's ticking along but I think, fairly well. I think the proof is in the pudding that it works, doesn't it? I mean, you've yeah. got obviously nutrient-rich substrate, which is feeding the crypts and, and most of the other plants. Yeah. Uh, the, the stuff that doesn't need substrate fertilization, like the pellia, is undemanding anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, either, I mean, compositionally it's even quite strong. You've got like a kind of a, like a distinct U shape going yeah. on here. This is almost like a focal point area. Yeah. The, the, so in terms of aquascaping, it, it's really strong. I, I kind of regard it more as a jungle style. But well, I was going to say, I mean, it's kind of your fault, this tank, because you <laughs> did a jungle tank years ago, yeah. which taught me a lot about mixing textures yeah. and using textures like the, the Eponogetons and the, the uh, Eponogeton folio in here. Um, to make all these contrasts, really rich contrasts and, and shadows and depths in the tank. And that was very much in my mind when I started laying this out. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to sort of tall plants at the back, short plants at the front layout. So I've yeah. got one corner sort of planted further towards the rear and one corner planted further towards the glass. So there's yeah. a bit of a, a view. Yeah. The sense of depth. Yeah. And there's still, I love the way that just the textures are mixed. It gets yep. this real kind of wild and chaotic look. Yeah. But still, there is quite a strong composition and it's not just chaos, it's controlled yeah, I, somewhat. I, 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 I find it hard to sort of do the, the very uh, very heavily maintained yeah. uh, tanks um, and as I was knew I was going away for well really two years with a few trips back, yeah. um, I needed to have a tank that could just be left to its own devices yeah. and chose very slow growing plants um, that wouldn't overwhelm the tank except for the Sagittaria which there were two yeah. in here. Okay. And they just well, we'll talk about your trips abroad in a minute because they're yeah. really important to the whole kind of your philosophy. Um, but let's talk about the fish. So yeah. they, they, to me, they look like pretty much all South American yeah. tetras, um, is that right? With the exception of the two uh, Siamese algae eaters, uh-huh. which just in there for maintenance. Yeah. They're all um, tetras from Amazon Basin and from the Paraguay Basin uh, in, the, in the Pantanal wetlands. Uh-huh. Um, I love tetras. I think a lot of them are, are really overlooked that have been in the hobby for a long time, um, such as the black neons, the head and tail like tetras. Um, people just think of them as bread and butter and not very interesting, but if you put them in a tank and give them just time and space and numbers, uh, they really reward you by colouring up and, and looking beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's the key. I think a lot of people, um, especially beginners in the hobby, want to keep as many species as they can in there. Yeah. You know, their first question of is often on Facebook groups, etc., is how many fish can I put in my tank? Exactly. And then after that, it's how many different kinds of species can I mix together? Yeah. Whereas um, my personal taste is to see large shoals of, of one or two species. species. You know, you've got more than that here, but you've got the space to do them justice, I think. Well, the original intention was pretty much only to have uh, a large shoal of black neons in here. Um, but I kept stumbling across fish that I really loved and wanted, <laughs> and they yeah. kept finding their way in. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of bycatch, like the 
Um, Munkazi de Crora here, which you are never imported deliberately. Right. Um, but they were in a tank together with some. These? Yeah, these guys here. Beautiful, aren't um, they? Got the iridescent green and blue. I don't know if you can see it, but I'll hopefully get some close ups for you guys. Absolutely stunning. And they were in a tank together with my other favourite touch, which is Hemogrammus Ulrea. Ulrea, right, um, yeah. They come from the same area, they've clearly been imported together. I thought, well, I've got, I've got to put them in. Yeah. Um, and then I like the sense of adding quite cryptic species. So I've got Caracidium fasciatum in here, uh -huh. which is the little data caracins. Oh, okay, I've um, seen them, yeah. And they sort of hang out at the lower levels and, and flit about, add a bit of movement and interest. Yeah. Um, and then I also like the idea of taking a few very colourful species and almost hiding them in the tank, and it rewards you when you find them, which yeah. is what I've done with the ruby tetras. Yeah. Um, these little bright orange gems. Yeah. And it's only when you sit down and you really yeah. watch. It's like a delayed gratification, isn't it? Yeah. You sit there and you have to be patient and then you're rewarded. Exactly. Rather than everything being thrown at you in one go. Yeah. And that, for me, that's what aquascaping is. A lot of it's about. It's about appreciating like an understated, more subtle beauty. Yeah. Rather than, you know, in stark contrast, you have maybe like a high end reef tank, which yeah. is like super colourful. Loads of movement, look, look at me, you know, it's almost like a show off. Yes. Whereas something like this is much more of a, like I say, like a subtle, naturalistic beauty. I think yeah. you can compare it very much to um, the art world in the sense you've got the, the very famous paintings like, you know, yeah. Scream, for example, which people go and look at and wow, there's this instant yeah. image there. And then there are other uh, artists where you really need to take your time to study the painting and yeah. you see the little details start to come out and yeah, small yeah, yeah. things emerge. It's the same with the tank. Yeah, great. And and it is, as you said, it's it's a reward to take your time and see what's going yeah. on. Yeah, I think you can apply that philosophy also to um, aquascaping in terms of the time scale. Yeah. So you know, I, I'm a bit of a kind of uh, hypocrite really because I like to create high impact straight away. Yeah. But conversely, if you are a hobbyist on a limited budget, especially, you don't have to, you know, absolutely fill it with hardscape or, you know, really yeah. big plants. You keep, I mean, most of these were tissue culture, right? Yeah, uh, pretty much all uh, in vitro pots. So they would have been like really small and the, and the tank would have looked quite, yeah. not very high impact at all, would it, it? It was quite hard to leave it in that state and I almost felt ashamed, you know, people are going to come to my house and see this thing and yeah. think, oh, this is a bit bare. Yeah, um, but, but the, you're rewarded now, sort of 12 months later, with an absolute beauty. And this, this tank has no hardscape. Uh, whatsoever. Wow. Um, so the monosalene is just literally a ball? Yeah, I just tucked a little bit in. And you've got some amazing, let's talk about the lilies. Okay. The nymphia. Yeah, um, so these are Nymphaea gardneriana, which are principally a carpeting lily in, under high light. Um, and you find them in Pantanal wetlands in uh, southwest Brazil. And they form in quite fast flowing clear rivers. Right. 10 by 4 meter carpets of wow. red, orange, yellow, green ripples about 20-30 centimetres high yeah. um, and then in areas where there's less light or in lakes then they'll go up to the surface and they produce beautiful red uh, lily pads. I managed to get a couple via um, Aquasabi. Yeah, um, the German guys. German guys and they're the only place I've managed to find them oh, yeah. um, and I put them in and I had them previously in a high light, high CO2 tank and they formed this beautiful little carpet. I shut that down, put them in here and they've just slowly ticked by, but they add that little bit of colour and, and, and shape that's different to everything else. Yeah. Brazil yeah and um, can you explain what you're doing there and some of the things that you've seen maybe okay I'm um, currently doing a master's in animal biology at um, University in Brazil I've been there for a year I've got another year of the course and I study fish behavior um, in a series of clear water rivers around the town of Bonito which is this world-famous 
uh, place in the state of Mato Grosso del Sul. Super clear water? Yeah, cr crystal clear. Um, and then you get a super great plant growth, I'm guessing? Yeah, um, because of the, the, the clarity of the water, you've got lots of sunlight penetration and you get these underwater gardens. Um, and I'm studying two species of pike cichlid, uh, Quenicicla, um, and how they manage to live and occupy the same space at the same time and look at their diet and their, their predatory behaviour, what they're feeding on, when they feed, yeah. which involves lots of snorkelling and diving with underwater cameras. And uh, the nice thing is that along with these fish, I've got um, caiman crocodiles in the water with me. I've been in the water with anacondas, tapir. Um, you've got corridor forest along the river. And you'll be there and suddenly all the, the fruit-eating fish will race to the surface and it's because there's monkeys leaping from branches <laughs> to another <laughs> and they're fruit down. dropping right. fruit, <laughs> the fish know. Um, you've got giant uh, predatory dorada, which is uh, yeah. Salminus brasilensis, huge fish um, cruising past you. And it's one of the best places to go and see very famous uh, tetra, the Serpe tetra, yeah. Hyphus abraconecis. And the, the red coloration on them is just Insane, is out of this world. Please tell me you got footage of this. Yes, plenty of footage of that. Um, and you'll, you swim down the main channel and there's large and medium species of fish swimming around but the joy is going into the margins where the forest meets the river where you've got uh, roots, you've got fallen branches, you've got marginal plants yeah. and you start seeing things, uh, you know, shoals of tiny tetras being predated by uh, medium sized predators, yeah. um, breeding behaviour going on. It's got this whole ecosystem in front yeah. of your eyes going on. And it's, right. it's a real privilege to, to do my work there. Yeah. Um, and I feel very lucky because it, I always wanted to be a, a biologist and it's, it's not what I studied at undergrad. I worked in the trade, I worked for Maidenhead Aquatics for a while. Yeah. I then ended up working as an aquarist at London Zoo. Yeah, I think that's when we met, wasn't it? Yeah. I was so a little bit of background. I'm the first met Ty in 2015. Uh, yeah. And we did a uh, reader visit for Practical Fishkeeping magazine. Yeah. I'll leave a link actually in the description. And I'd just come back from Brazil, actually. Yeah, and you had like seven tanks on the go. Yeah, quite. I had um, from. I went and visited the Pantanal wetlands, which are these, you know, giant swamps and flooded forest and flooded meadows. And I set up three tanks in the room, one representing a different kind of habitat uh, that I'd seen. And the, yeah, there's so many fish and plants that we have in the ho hobby that come from that region, and no one even knows about it. Everyone yeah. goes and looks at the Amazon. Um, but it's a it's a fantastic place. Wow! And it's I'm I'm, I'm tempted to book a trip. Actually. Yeah, uh, insane. Uh, this come. year, uh, I've got a really busy year, but I'd love to come just like for a week or so. It's good because it's one of the more accessible parts of the country, wow. and it's also relatively safe. Okay. Um, and the fish, uh, I mean, the life. One of the rivers that I sort of work in has 63 species of fish in that river. Wow. If you think that the entire UK has 47 species yeah, of fish. Yeah, so just fish. in one river. Yeah. And there's a lot of fish that you find in the hobby? Yeah, um, so we've got some examples here, the Hemigramus aurea, which is the broken line tetra. Yeah. Um, the sed tetras, which are the Hyphosobricon equis. Um, not too far away from that region, you find the type locality of black neons, um, which I got to visit in August, which was pretty fantastic. Um, you've got Rathbun's tetras, Bloodfin's tetras. Um, you can find, I got to swim with them in November, uh, freshwater rays like wow. Postman Trigon, uh, Matoro, and Falconeri. Wow. Um, there's some amazing predators for the, the oddball uh, fans, you know, yeah. uh, wolffish, needlefish, and it's also home to the popular cichlid uh, Oscars. Wow. Which you okay. get to swim with and, uh, and are see. Are they really big? And, uh, yeah, they're large and you often find them in the shallows, almost on their sides, sunning themselves. Wow. And um, yeah, it's, it's sort of everywhere you turn there's fish. Yeah. Um, and there's also species of, of killifish, for example, that have been recorded uh, in the flooded footprints of cattle, where there are cattle uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> fields. Fishing. Uh, yeah, living there. So. Everywhere you go, there's fish. Wow, um, that's amazing. Yeah. And what about uh, the aquatic plants that you see in there? So, um, various kinds of Eleocaris, the hair grasses. Okay. Uh, Heteranthera sosterifolia, the star yeah, grass, which yeah. is popular aquascaping yeah, plant. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is, in the river where I work, that's the main plant. And you get these sort of huge um, shrub and mounds of it. Yeah. And occasionally these get caught on overhanging branches of trees 
and then they get pulled up above the surface and they form these islands growing out of the water. Wow. And underneath is a habitat for fish and on top is a habitat for insects and birds. Um, various species of nymphaea, including the Gardneriana, which we mentioned. Um, different kinds of Sagittaria, lots of different marginal plants, other kinds of lilies. Um, it's it sounds amazing, what an amazing. crazy place. So uh, Ty's got loads of footage, I'll overlap some during this yeah. interview at relevant points. So there you go guys, brief insight into Ty's treatments, uh, aquarium and some of his background about his travelling in Brazil etc. Yeah. Really cool guy, thanks so much for inviting me over. Yeah. Uh, do, he does have a YouTube channel and do please check it out, subscribe if you're interested in these sort of under, got loads of underwater footage. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting as much uh, habitat footage and uh, imaging on there as I can yeah. because I want to share this with people who yeah. Haven't managed to get out there, or, or yeah, exactly. What I think of going there. Yeah, and it's it's really cool. Do, do check it out. I'll leave a link in the description and also in the card wherever it is, at the top of the screen. Really enjoyed looking at the tank, mate. Getting to meet you again and you. talking about your travels. It's been epic. And yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that first installation of Meet the Scaper. Let me know what you think, guys. And uh, give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and keep on scaping. Take care. Cheerio. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>